address us and wrap up and uh, make the link between the UK IGF and the global IGF. This is something that uh, IGF around the world, national and regional, do um, as a matter of routine. They, uh, they take the messages from, in our case, from London, from the UK, to the global IGF uh, and uh, report on what's been said and, uh, and, and, and interact with their counterparts from around the world. So with that, I will let David and Andrew uh, wrap up today. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Um We're just going to divide. I mean, we, we haven't really got the opportunity to kind of summarize the day, and I think we've all sat through it anyway. So what we're planning to do is just give and the first 15 minutes some reflections on the day, and then in the second 15 minutes, look forward to both the IGF in Guadalajara and some of the wider international challenges that we see emerging given both recent political events and the way the technology and, and politics globally is developing. So maybe, David, you'll, you'll kick off. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much. Firstly, I'd like to say this has been a fantastic day. I mean, this is the, I'll be lucky if any session in Guadalajara is as interesting as any session here has been. Um, so congratulations to everybody involved on that. Um, I thought I'd try and pick out three themes which kind of run through the day. I hope this doesn't sound too artificial. But the first of the themes was, uh, I'd say, standards, rules, and norms. Um, what our minister referred to, I think, or meant when he was referring to uh, the internet being free but not lawless. Um, and just to, I think that ran through all of the themes. Let me illustrate. So with Brexit, for example, we've got a high degree of uncertainty about the impact of Brexit, largely, I think, because there's a high degree of uncertainty about Brexit itself. But um, one thing that is clear is that our current online environment is built substantially around rules and norms that have been established in the EU. And what happens to those rules and norms is important, not just those we have now, but those that the EU will be establishing in the weeks and months and years after we leave. Uh, so can we really envisage a context where we're diverging considerably from the rules and norms that are being agreed in the future on the continent? There's issue around that. Secondly, on privacy and identity, um, the discussion was largely about identity protection and rules and norms that apply to that. I sort of add another dimension to it, which is I think there's a fundamental change in the nature of our relationship with privacy, with data, um, which is that the data that are held on us are now held on our gathered and collected by default. There's no intention, intervention on our part or even on those of data gatherers. They're gathered digitally by default. That will grow with the Internet of Things, and it fundamentally alters the concept of privacy, to my mind, um, and requires new rules, new norms that are associated with privacy. Uh, on cyber attack, or the whole cyber security agenda, the developing countries I work with see that at the top of their agendas. Um, here, I think, two central points. So the, the future use of the Internet depends on trust among users, which is vulnerable. Um, and secondly, and in a sense more important, our whole society's increasing dependence on the internet to make it work as, as, as economy, as society, as culture, um, makes our whole societies vulnerable in ways that require very high levels of cybersecurity and new and continuously evolving standards, rules, and norms. And then on political discourse, and also I think the youth panel, um, I wrote these notes before the youth panel because it was so fascinating, I've not updated them, but. Um, very different views, I think, expressed in, on the panel about the extent to which social media and the internet have affected political decisions, um, partly about a question of balance, I suppose, between wider engagement in politics on the one hand and the corrosion of political discourse on the other. Um, but in both of those cases, what's happening is that people are not following the norms of behavior they have previously followed. Um, and much of the discussion on the youth panel, I think, was also about the way in which people are not following historic norms of behavior. Um, so I've tried to cobble those things together in the sense that a lot of the discussion has actually been around standards, rules, and norms. Much more quickly, second and third themes. The second one, I think, high degree of complexity and diversity of experience online. And I sort of summarize it like this. Much we value, like privacy, that we want to protect, much we want, like access to information that we want to obtain, much we fear, for example, cybercrime that we want to avoid. And the balance between these things is clearly different for different people and for different demographics. So we had a very interesting discussion around the youth demographic there. I think we also need policymakers to explore with the demographic itself, not with academic experts, but with the demographic itself, how the elderly feel, how language minorities feel, how lower income groups and claimant, uh, benefit claimants feel, how those with disabilities feel, 
in those particular areas. Those are groups that have less access and are more vulnerable, uh, not notably more vulnerable to cybercrime. And the final point, um, uh, again, Minister Matt Hancock said, and this is a point I would frequently make myself, the pace of technology exceeds the capacity of human institutions to adapt to it. That's the critical challenge we have in developing those standards, rules, and norms. Um, uh, the, the ones we need to have, say, keep what we value, achieve what we want, avoid what we fear. Um, so it's very difficult to do that within that rapid, frame, uh, rapid change and uncertainty. Multi-stakeholder engagement is actually one of the ways we've developed in order to try and ensure that rules and norms are adaptive uh, and move forward in ways that address diverse needs and have general consent. Uh, and I think that's an important kind of dimension of what the multi-stakeholder agenda is about. And I'll say a few words later about international cooperation as well. I think I managed that in six minutes or so. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, so like a lot of internet policy conversations, I think they often, and I think today was a, another example of it, they veer between the utopian and dystopian, often in the same session. I think overall, in the, in the overall arch of conversations that I'm part of internationally, I'd say we're increasingly dystopian, actually, about what the internet is doing and how it's working, both in the economy, the way it affects human communication, politics, and so on. And I think one of the characteristics for me, that again, I think it was reflected today in some of the sessions Dan Hodges remarked on it, is in a world awash with data, the actual impact of the internet on an economy, on the way we communicate, on our politics, it's, it's usually a data-free discussion. There's actually very little evidence. There's a lot of assumptions, a lot of opinions. And I think one of the things we need to grapple with is how do we genuinely assess the impact, impact of this communication medium on all of those key policy issues, given that we, we don't actually have a very sound basis for many of the assertions we make about both its liberating effects, but also its transgressive and, uh, and, and dystopian effects. Uh, one thing I think does emerge for me, and it was reinforced today both in the youth session and in the politics session, is the significant change in the way that human communication is taking place because of the global interconnectedness of the internet. And I think Dan Hodges said that he thought the most important uh, invention in human communication in terms of politics was the Gutenberg printing press. And I tend to agree with that because I think what Gutenberg did was usher in a whole period where human communication has been characterized by text, by the word, and by the authority of the word, which has been mediated by journalists, by editors, by publishers, by censors, by people who can verify and check what's going on. And I think, what, as, many, as some observers have said, I think what the internet's doing is just taking us back to a pre-Gutenberg era where our, sense, our, our communication is characterized by oral communication. And we're going back, I think, to a situation much like the old medieval marketplace on a global level, where rumor, facts, information, gossip, family and friends, those oral communications sit alongside real facts and real information. And it's very hard for anyone to distinguish or really separate out the status of either of them. But, and I think that's a very significant change in the arc of human communication. And if you think back to the Gutenberg era, the church, the Catholic Church, was very anxious about the printing press because it didn't want people reading the Bible in vernacular languages because they might misinterpret it. They might form their own views about God and their own views about the future. And in some ways, the Catholic Church was very right to be concerned because if you look at 17th, 18th century England, certainly the history I know, it was full of millenarian cults of utter insanity where people believed the world was going to end tomorrow and therefore they could do all kinds of things that really weren't that helpful to them or their society. And in many ways, the Thirty Years' War was one of the products of the Gutenberg era in that clash that that came to it. And so I think we're going to be entering in a period where we're going to have to learn, just as humanity had to learn how to read, how to interpret metaphor, how to realize that everything you read in the Bible wasn't literally true, we're now going to have to learn on the internet how not everything you see, communicate, and hear in that oral culture also has the same status. And we're going to have to learn to distinguish. And I suspect it will take us many, many generations to do this, just as it took us many generations to understand, in a genuine sense, how to read author texts. We need now to understand how to read and understand uh, oral communications. And I think we need to recognize that governments have 
a responsibility in this, in this field. Permissionless innovation, as Vince Cerf called it, doesn't abrogate the responsibility of governments to look after their citizens in this new world and to deal with the challenges posed by robotics, artificial intelligence, network peer sharing, and all the other kind of features that come with, with the modern internet. But it's very obvious, I think, the governments don't really know how to do that. They know that there should be, as Matt Hancock said, some rules that govern the system, but there's no real sense of how to impose and develop rules for a global system other than purely normatively, and we'll perhaps reflect on that in the second half of our discussion, the, the prospects for that normative, that normative movement. But I do detect that mo increasingly throughout the world, governments, and the UK may be an exception, and the US may be an exception, are not that interested genuinely in multi-stakeholder policy development. If you look at the IGF, it's hollowing out as a process from being a multi-stakeholder process to one dominated by civil society, who I would say probably form three quarters of the population of any event, and I think that's likely to be true, be true in Guadalajara. It was certainly true in Jao Pesawa. And governments are preferring to move bilaterally or multilaterally when it comes to issues where their vital interests at stake. And that, to be honest, that's true for the UK. It's cyber security strategy very important part of national strategy, did not involve a genuine multi-stakeholder process. The government talked to some companies, but there was no real engagement with civil society and no engagement with the wider public in the formulation of that strategy. So we can talk the talk of multi-stakeholderism, but there's a very significant challenge, I think, in realising what it means when genuine state and popular interests are at stake. Now the future, David. Uh, well, maybe not the future, but um, the Thanks. international context, because I think... Um, national IGFs like this were kind of intended for two purposes. One was to look down at the country that they're in, uh, and that's mostly what we've done today, and the other was to feed into the, the global IGF and to, to look at the bigger, the wider international issues. So I've got five points I want to make about that. Two are to do with the IGF itself, and the other three are more general. Now, the IGF itself. So the IGF uh, was renewed um, for a second tenure, or for another 10 years, at the UN um, General Assembly last December, and um, that was seen as a cause for celebration by a lot of people, by its supporters. Um, uh, uh, certainly it was not a guaranteed outcome of, what, uh, of the discussions that had gone before. However, a key point about this is that, um, again, I'm citing the minister, uh, it shouldn't rest on its laurels. Um, in practice, uh, there are really quite significant problems, I think, with, with the IGF, which it needs to address. Uh, so the United Nations organized a retreat um, for about 40, 50 people about this earlier in the year, which I and a couple of other people from the UK attended. It produced a lot of valuable ideas. It was uh, under Chatham House rules. There was a widespread discussion. Um, and it, I think it identified three particular problems. One was that the IGF was uh, there's a significant element of self-satisfaction about it. We've achieved a multi-stakeholder IGF um, and not pushing forward from that. Second, that it was becoming something of an insider forum, uh, what I call multi-stakeholderism of the like-minded. Um, um, and third, uh, that it wasn't addressing the kind of complex issues that we've actually been discussing today with the degree of sophistication that we've been discussing them today. That there was too much kind of blandness about what was being said um, uh, that was coming from it. And it doesn't engage effectively with other international fora. So, these are not, I mean, these are, I'm not saying that the IGF is a bad thing. I'm saying that it has weaknesses as well as achievements. And I'm really disappointed that the outcomes of the IGF retreat don't seem to have been discussed at any of the national IGFs that I'm aware of. Um, so that, that, that work is not really being, being fed forward. I think it would be really good if those of us who are at in Mexico this year have a discussion afterwards about how we think we can make the IGF better and how Britain could contribute to doing that. Um, the theme this year is enabling inclusive and sustainable growth. IGF themes are usually very bland. Um, this is about the fourth time it's had sustainable in, its, in the title. And essentially it's a reference to sustainable development. I hope that at this time there'll be some more sophisticated attention to that. And the problem in the past has been that Discussions at the IGF around sustainable development have consisted of internet experts saying what they think sustainable development is, and there hasn't been serious engagement from the sustainable development world. Um, I think what really is necessary here is to invert that. The IGF needs to listen to the sustainable development world and to, as it does to other external communities. And if it does that, it might notice some things which I think are really important. The most important um, report this year on the internet and development was from the World Bank, the World Development Report, in January. 
two major conclusions from that. Uh, that the internet has had much less impact on development outcomes that have been anticipated 10 years ago, and that the internet has probably increased inequality in developing countries over that period. So those are issues that need fundamental thought at areas like the IGF. So my three points about the global environment more generally. Um, earlier this week, uh, I was at the International Jurisdiction Conference in Paris, um, which um, was concerned with how the internet interacts with national jurisdictions in issues particularly such as criminality. And I think one thing that struck me throughout those three days of that conference is you can't look at those issues without seeing how critically important international cooperation is to doing anything effective within countries, between countries, however it might be. Um, and that's international cooperation, not just between governments, but also between stakeholders. So, International cooperation is absolutely fundamental to, to going forward. My second point around this would be around the nature of, of the international internet discourse. I don't think we can separate internet governance today from geopolitics. Um, there's a reason why many developing countries um, prefer multilateral agencies to multi, to multi stakeholder. Um, agencies or multi-stakeholder entities, and not just the governments of multi uh, uh, developing countries too. It's because they have more voice. So that entering a multi-stakeholder space which is dominated by northern governments and northern businesses does not look like a multi-stakeholder space to an African government or, e or African civil society or African business. So I was pleased that Larry Strickling mentioned uh, at the start how important it was to ensure that multi-stakeholder spaces are spaces which have real opportunities for developing country participants of all stakeholder communities to play a substantive part. That's really, I think, crucial, and it has to be a substantive role if things like the IGF are to go forward uh, or to move forward effectively. My last point is a really rather depressing one. Um, so the internet is internationalist, but geopolitics today is not internationalist. I think if you look around the world, and the, let's say the, the 10, 20 years that is the internet age, let's say the 10 years that is the internet age, we've seen an upsurge in hostility to globalization. We've seen an upsurge in nationalist and protectionist sentiment. We've seen a growth in authoritar authoritarianism. Um, and in this country, we've seen a clear, re a clear rejection of an international governance mechanism uh, that we've been part of for a long period of time. Uh, so we're talking, I think, in the internet about the importance of engaging in greater international cooperation at a time when, in fact, the international environment is not terribly propitious for greater international cooperation. And that's a real challenge for us. I think we need to think about the ways in which we can address that. Um, uh, that goes beyond the internet, of course, but I think it's really important for us in the internet community especially. So, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, the question of internet governance globally and whether we can sustain the current model is very much one that we have to look at quite seriously now, given, given recent events. So we know that the Russians for several years have been increasingly aggressive about trying to assert a kind of Westphalian notion of sovereignty over the internet. But if you look at what the Chinese are doing now, which is really inserting themselves very subtly in a whole range of policy and technical bodies, not just the UN and the ITU, but in ICANN, in the ITF, and a whole range, and sending very smart people who really know what they're talking about. So they're now populating a number of these key, within this dispersed policy framework, <laughs> They're populating it with extremely capable people who have a long-term agenda to shape the internet the way the Chinese government wishes it to be shaped. And uh, the, the truth is that in this area, as in many other areas, uh, democratic governments and European governments have relied on the United States to do a lot of the heavy diplomatic lifting to defend the current model of internet governance. And the US has been very active in sending large delegations to every single policy forum and, if necessary, pushing back against any attempt to create a kind of state framework for internet regulation. And I think, frankly, with the Trump presidency, we have to at least contemplate the fact that that will no longer be the case, that the US will no longer see itself as uh, having a role in championing global norm-based rules and may well refer back to a very, very America-first nationalist approach saying, what's good for us and how do we promote our own national agenda? And that's something that I think would be worth reflecting on because there will be a gap that European countries could fill. Whether they will fill, I don't know. Do you want to go, is this a... Do you think that we could see a situation 
Do you think we could see the situation based on what you've just said, where W3C, which has retained core controls, could become someone we end up being against? You know, I think a number of the, uh, you know, I think at the, this stage, anything's possible. And tracking and monitoring the very complex dispersed policy environment, which in one sense is great when it's working for you, but another sense is much more difficult to deal with when other people are much more active and engaged than we are. That's, that's kind of a real problem. Can I make a request then? Yeah. I don't know if anyone from Nominet would be willing to, but at least fund a study to see if W3C were to become hostile under Trump governance, whether it's a real case scenario to protect UK going forward out of Europe and the Commonwealth and see what the aspects will be with specific to Crown dependencies and ourselves. Okay. I'll leave that to somebody else to, 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 re, to reflect we, on. We could invite people from W3C next time. Okay. Maybe. But I think what we are definitely seeing is the erosion of the rules-based international order that really was established in 1945. You know, just yesterday, Russia said it's pulling out of the ICC. President Duterte of the Philippines today, I think, has talked about pulling out of the ICC. South Africa's pulling out of the ICC. So one of the kind of major achievements of the post-war global human rights era is really disintegrating in front of our eyes now very, very fast. And I think that's symptomatic of a general problem of the erosion of a rules-based order and a return to what really we could characterize as very intense geopolitical competition across the world. And that will not be good for the internet. And behind the scenes, I think, therefore, we need to look at the IGF is one place, but I suspect the ITU will be a much more important body in the next four years. If you look at the kind of issues that are on the ITU's agenda, whether it's counterfeit phones or digital object management, which the ITU effectively has hegemony over through the Nova Foundation, and which many people, including many people in the ITU, seeing as a different way of doing the internet by actually ensuring the internet of things is managed in a very different way, effectively under the hegemony of the ITU. So I think there's a need for us to recalibrate how we think about internet governments, re recognize the serious challenges we face. And I think one of the questions for the UK government going forward from here is, if the UK government wants to prove it's no longer in retreat from the world, in withdrawing from the European Union, and if it sees itself as having a wider global role, and if we can persuade our foreign secretary to stop making jokes at foreigners' expense and focus on a policy agenda, maybe there's a role for the UK in taking some kind of leadership in pushing forward a norms rules-based order, which is something, after all, very integral to British history over the last two or three hundred years. And I think that's something that would be really interesting to, to leave with them. And I think at that stage, I think David and I have said our piece. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew and David. That was almost positive towards the end. <laughs> <laughs>